Until the pandemic came and hit us, I think a lot of people were not quite so aware as to how much our lives are impacted by global events that might start anywhere. This is a real crisis. I mean, it's been clear that this was likely to spread in the U.S. We need to be thinking much more ambitiously. Climate finance is a very big issue. We, the Center for Global Development, we're a group that try and see how we can make the international system that supports global development work more effectively. CGD came about because it was time to focus not only on what developing countries should do, but much more on what the rich world should do. How do we finance infrastructure in the poorest parts of the world? How do we increase productivity in agriculture? What kind of policy brings out the best outcomes? Some of our previous work has helped to come up with a kind of innovative financing mechanism that was used to help launch pneumococcal vaccines. We really have researchers and experts here at CGD who come at these issues from multiple vantage points and I think that's just what helps make our research more rigorous, more rich and actually more connected to the realities that decision makers are grappling with. We've been looking to CGD for all of your research and analysis uh, to guide us. So CGD is nonpartisan. Because of that, over the years, that credibility has given us significant convening power. Our government highly values the work. What CGD is about is you can ask those difficult questions that people refuse to ask and actually find solutions. We're thinking about how climate change will impact migration patterns, how that will in turn have impacts on people's health. It's challenging to be able to align budget with ambitious programmatic goals, but it can be done. Every single time that we're able to get it right, it means you know, we're reducing significant poverty. If you can help to make things a little bit better, that's a good way to spend your time. Welcome to the Center for Global Development. I'm Amanda Glassman. I'm an Executive Vice President and Senior Fellow here. Lessons are still emerging from the COVID-19 pandemic, but what's certainly clear is that a disease outbreak anywhere in the world can affect, uh, is a threat to the rest of the world, and effective international cooperation is essential to protect against the next pandemic threat. And we've seen many examples of cooperation over the past two and a half years, and many of these conversations are evolving in real time. As I speak, this week, the World Health Organization Intergovernmental Negotiating Body is meeting to discuss next steps on a pandemic accord. And last month, the Indonesian presidency of the G20 hosted the official launch of the Pandemic Fund at the World Bank, and the fund's governing board is convening again next week. Today, the Center for Global Development and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences have come together to take stock of lessons learned from COVID-19 and how we can assure a better global cooperation for equitable pandemic preparedness, both in its governments, its financing, and its operation. We're really excited to be joined by a very distinguished panel of experts. I'm joined by Dr. Jose Enrique Alvarez, who's a professor of international law at New York University, where he teaches courses on international law, foreign investment, and international organizations. We have Dr. David Fidler, who's a current senior fellow for global health and cybersecurity at the Council on Foreign Relations. We have Dr. Justice Novignon, who's the head of the Health Economics Program at the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as an associate professor of health economics at the School of Public Health at the University of Ghana. And in his spare time, he's also a Center for Global Development non-resident fellow. And finally, we have Dr. Jennifer Welsh, who's a Canada 150 Research Chair in Global Governance and Security at McGill University and the author of a recent paper on failures in international cooperation around COVID-19. Before we get started, let me introduce Dr. David Oxby, who's the President of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, to give us some opening remarks that will frame today's discussions. Thanks. Over to Thank you. Thank you. It's great. It's great to be with you all, and we're so glad that the American Academy of Arts and Sciences could collaborate with the Center for Global Development to organize today's event. I'd like to thank you, Amanda Glassman from the Center, and our panelists for joining us. To provide some brief background, the Academy was created in 1780 by our country's founders to produce knowledge and guide the new nation. Today, the Academy is a nonprofit membership organization and learned society for leaders in academia, business, philanthropy, medicine, journalism, and other areas. 
In keeping with our founder's vision, we are also an independent policy center devoted to finding solutions to the biggest issues facing the US and the globe. Out of recognition of the current crisis in humanitarian protection and the provision of health services in areas plagued by armed conflict, the Academy launched the Rethinking the Humanitarian Health Response to Violent Conflict in 2019. This project brings together legal and security experts, health professionals, leaders of humanitarian organizations, policymakers, artists, and representatives of victimized communities. It's based on the premise that these new approaches are best derived from a deeper transdisciplinary understanding of the changing political, military, legal, and health dimensions that are dramatically redefining humanitarian challenges throughout the world. As conditions have evolved since the project originally launched, the project's leaders have prioritized activities that responded to the needs arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. The project continues to adapt to changing realities while remaining committed to its fundamental goals, including helping to define new, more effective strategies for the effective provision of humanitarian health responses to populations in need in real world settings. I look forward to the discussion today on governance and financing for global cooperation on pandemic pre preparedness. And we'll turn it over now to Amanda to moderate the discussion. Thanks so much, David, and uh, really exciting to partner with you on this important work. So I'm going to turn to each of our panelists for about five minutes of opening remarks, um, and then we'll do a round of questions and answers. Uh, while you're watching in the audience, if you can uh, go ahead and post your questions below our YouTube feed or uh, signal us on Twitter at CGDEV and hashtag CGDTalks or email events at cgdev.org. So let's get started. We're going to start with Jennifer, who's written this excellent paper. Uh, get us started, and then we'll go to our other panelists. Thanks so much. And it is, uh, it's great to be with you uh, to hammer through some of these issues that continue to affect our thinking about pandemic preparedness and response. So our stream of work through the American Academy was designed in essence to respond to three of the articles that are contained in the preamble of the draft text prepared this past July by the International Negotiating Body for a new convention agreement or legal instrument on pandemic preparedness and response. The first is paragraph 12, which expresses concern about the lack of solidarity and global cooperation shown during COVID-19. We did see significant levels of coordination among scientists below the state level during the pandemic, but international cooperation was sorely lacking despite previous pandemic episodes and reform efforts. And cooperation as we defined it in the project is about more than just coordination or alignment. It requires repeated and structured interactions, harmonized policies and reciprocal commitments to reach a common goal. The second paragraph is uh, paragraph 23, which underscores that multilateral cooperation and governance are actually essential to prevent, prepare for, and respond to future pandemics. Pandemics that know no borders and require collective action. And the last is paragraph 10, which acknowledges the significant differences in countries' capacities to prevent, prepare for, and respond to pandemics. And for us, this latter point was particularly important because it suggests that while an effective system for preventing the spread of diseases with pandemic potential is deemed to be a global public good, these differences in capacities and vulnerabilities have meant that many, if not most states, did not view uh, COVID-19 or pandemic preparedness response in that way. While the mantra, no one is safe until everyone's safe is a very powerful moral imperative, not all actors accepted its validity politically or epidemiologically during uh, the recent pandemic. So our work convened specialists in global health with general international relations scholars and experts on addressing common threats in other domains like environmental degradation and weapons of mass destruction to try to identify the preconditions for effective cooperation that have been highlighted in academic literature. One of our first tasks, as you'll see in the paper, was to closely review the evolution of the global health security regime to understand what mechanisms actually exist and what they were designed to do. 
And our review demonstrated that in many ways, the international health regulations of 2005 were already designed with an eye to what we have learned about international cooperation in other domains. In other words, they were drafted with a concern for creating incentives for collaboration and for creating mechanisms for peer review. And on paper, they seem to give a significant degree of authority to the Director General of the WHO to declare a public health emergency of international concern and to use information from non-governmental sources. So the biggest problem was not so much a legal one, creating firm obligations, but rather addressing the lack of compliance with existing mechanisms. In this latter respect, our project discussed how competitive dynamics between the great powers, particularly the US and China, could both constrain and enable cooperative arrangements. Unlike during the Cold War, when some cooperation on infectious disease was possible between the Soviet Union and the United States, we saw that geopolitical competition between today's two superpowers directly affected pandemic preparedness and response, including through efforts to demonstrate the capacity and competence of their competing systems of government. Our project also noted that optimal institutions or arrangements to facilitate cooperation often fail to emerge, even when there are large potential gains to be captured. Moments of crisis don't always translate into successful reform. They have to be seized and guided by skillful leadership and determined activism. One of our key tasks was to come to grips with the precise nature of the cooperation problem in the field of pandemic preparedness and response. And by implication, to be sure we weren't drawn to governance mechanisms that actually aren't well suited to this domain. Cooperation in the field of pandemic preparedness and response is particularly complex compared to other domains, such as, for example, nuclear proliferation, because it entails many participants, takes place over a long period of time, is multifaceted in scope, and must be based on a common scientific and epidemiological foundation. Some of the commentary on pandemic preparedness and response has framed the challenge through a public good lens and argued that enforcement mechanisms are needed to address problems of free riding by states. But we questioned that assumption and drew attention to the key distribution problems that have shaped policymaking as a result of differences in states' capacities. States vary in what they have been willing to commit to based on those capacities and vulnerabilities. So while high income countries prioritize the rapid sharing of information about disease outbreaks from around the world, low income countries worry about their capacity to act on that information, even if they have it. They worry more about improving the provision of health related public goods domestically and fear creating new international obligations without financial mechanisms to enable implementation. As has been stressed by many analysts, it's really crucial as we move forward to understand and confront the incentives that shape state behavior. While all states have some interest in rapid information exchange, leading to timely recommendations to prevent the spread of infectious disease, governments that are concerned about outside scrutiny also have incentives to defect from transparency requirements. And that makes any kind of international challenge inspections unlikely. Finally, one of the things we did in this uh, research stream was to, to observe the importance of taking the long view, as impatient as we all are for more effective pandemic preparedness and response. Many prominent cooperation regimes took several years to negotiate and experienced ratification delays impacting their entry into force. International cooperation often manifests, manifests not in perfect designs, but in layers of collective action. And effective arrangements don't always require universal membership, but can be catalyzed through a smaller group of states, which is what in fact might be the best approach for the creation of a permanent platform for the equitable development and, uh, of and access to countermeasures. So as a result of the uncertainty around the outcome of the World Health Assembly's process for a new legal instrument, we think policy, policymakers should focus in the near term
on enhancing compliance with existing state commitments and addressing the challenges that arise from different state capacities, particularly through steps to address the economic and political barriers to comply with the IHR 2005 and to ensure the production and equitable provision of key public health interventions. So I'll stop there, Amanda, and uh, let others come in. Really a very, very good uh, overview of the work and, and thank you for that. And I, you know, I would say you're pointing to some really practical things that the global community could work towards that would enable all parties, uh, you know, enable us to find multiple places where we could get done what needs to get done for international cooperation in the space. And we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, let me now turn to you, Justice Novigno. Uh, Africa CDC is certainly a leader in the COVID-19 uh, response. Uh, I've seen your hashtag on Twitter, new public health order. Tell me uh, sort of what are the big take homes from where you're seated and uh, what would you hope to see as part of this pandemic accord discussion that's going on? Thank you, Amanda. Um, and thank you, Jennifer, for raising those critical points. Um, so following up from Jennifer, one of the points you made, we can see the enthusiasm, we see the speed of, of work around global health governance um, and financing for pandemic preparedness and response. And this is commendable. I mean, we know that this could take many years, but um, we are grateful that this, you know, this is really moving with, with, with relative speed. Um, we've also seen the setup of the pandemic fund at the, at the World Bank. We've seen the speed at which this, this was set up and, and that is commendable. However, permit me to make four quick points, um, high level points from, from our perspective. While global financing mechanisms and, and other uh, governance mechanisms um, play critical roles in in both mobilizing financial resources, but also clearly articulating what mechanisms um, pandemic preparedness and response would happen across the board from the global to the country level. There are significant access gaps um, or access challenges, let me put it that way, to particularly access to uh, low-income countries, low-middle-income countries accessing such funds. Um, in part due to the nature or the structure of the governance um, you know, processes, but also due to lack of absorptive, absorptive capacity at a country level. And in many cases, we are quick to conclude that countries do not have absorptive capacity. Um, but the real question is, what are we doing to ensure that the governance structures that we put in place for these pandemic, um, you know, treaties or these regulations, and the global financing mechanisms actually make it easier for countries to assess. Um, so for us, it is important to pat ourselves on the back um, for a good work done in setting up these processes um, with speed. But most importantly, we need to ask ourselves and pursue um, processes that really make access to these funds at the country levels and also by the internet populations um, relatively easy um, without you know, very huge costs at the global levels um, to the detriment of implementation. So that's, that's one. Two, um, we, we, we need to explore what are the most direct feasible means to reach countries and make implementation of EPRs, emergency preparedness and response programs easier, less bureaucratic for countries why we also ensure that the global players, I mean, the WHOs and all the other global players who need to be supported and funded um, to implement this, actually move, you know, and get the resources they need. So again, it relates to the first point, but um, we need to ensure that countries, I mean, the governance processes are relatively easier for countries uh, to assess. Third, these times, you know, are very key. They provide very good opportunities um, for us to revisit and correct the known challenges that we have um, with global health governance um, as we know it. 
we know that many of those challenges promote inequalities, uh, much as we can have equity as one of the key things in, in, in a pandemic accord that we are negotiating. We know that some of the structures with our global, current global health landscape promote inequalities, um, inequities, and negative externalities. You know, we should also not also shy away from the challenges with you know, the DH um, architecture, the um, development assistance for health. It is important for us to ensure that, um, for want of a better word, we do not polish on debt. So where I come from, we say polish on debt if you if you are simply polishing yourself um, on top of some negative things that you could simply have assessed and washed off. It is important for us to wash off these uh, so-called debts uh, or negative things with our current global health um, governance architecture to ensure that we get the best. And finally, um, one of the key things that we've seen from the COVID-19 pandemic is that regionalization and, re and the role of regional institutions such as the Africa CDC, but also other institutions is key. Uh, we've seen this with Ebola uh, virus disease. We've seen this with the COVID-19 pandemic. We need to not pretend to promote regional institutions on paper um, in emergency preparedness and response. We need to proactively make space for them at the table of negotiation, at the table of governance, at the table of financing, at the table of design and implementation of governance and financing mechanisms. We've seen challenges with this, part, you know, for example, with the COVAX and, and many of these global, um, you know, mechanisms um, where global not uh, colleagues, you know, for, for, for speed sake, um, there's a lot of um, engagement of global North colleagues, you know, to the detriment of global South colleagues. We need to make space for regional institutions um, at the table to ensure that we have everyone and every everything we need, every idea to push um, for this. So these are a few, um, these are comments that I'll make and I look forward to engaging the discussion. Over to you, Amanda. Thank you, Justice, and we'll we'll come back to this question about the role of regional platforms versus global platforms, especially as Act A is wrapping up. Uh, Act A was the global platform of which COVAX formed a part that was put together to try and do joint fundraising and then purchasing on behalf of uh, low and middle income countries. So we'll come back to that because one of the recommendations from the Jennifer's report really talks about a permanent platform for equitable access, both for treatments and vaccines and how that would work. So we'll, we'll come back to that point in a moment. Let's now uh, turn to David. You've, you've uh, long been a vocal a proponent of realism and uh, also the national security foreign policy perspective on some of these global health issues. So tell us, what do you see as sort of the big lessons and, and what we should be watching for in the next couple of months? Thank you, Amanda. And uh, yeah, let me focus on U.S. foreign policy and pandemic COVID-19. Um, I think it's safe and fair to the pandemic demonstrated that the United States was not prepared. For, and that lack of preparedness had devastating consequences on interests that foreign policy seeks to advance protecting national U.S. economy, supporting development strategies, and providing humanitarian. But this lack of preparedness was not because U.S. foreign policy had ignored global. In the two decades prior to the pandemic, the U.S. claimed to be and was a leader, a prominent leader in global health. However, it is exposed that U.S. global health leadership comprehensively failed with respect to global health threat to U.S. national interests, and that was a pandemic involving a dangerous respiratory virus. David, sorry now, to Biden you, but you put your microphone closer to your mouth just to see if that makes a difference? It's sort of going in and out. Thank you. Sorry. Is that better? Perfect. Thank you. Sorry. I'll, 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 have to keep it with it. I'll keep it here. Right. Now, the Biden administration recognizing that U.S domestic and foreign policies on pandemic preparedness. And just as some examples, not an exhaustive list of this, right? You, Biden administration with important fora concerning pandemic preparedness. 
2020, the World Bank. It supported adding pandemic preparedness to initiatives that it had long supported, the PEPFAR, the Global Fund. It helped lead the Creative Fund, and it made proposals and it's made proposals to upgrade U.S. biodefense and biability. So we've got, you know, and there, there could be other examples on that. However, how I'm seeing things, that, that imperative to transform U.S. foreign policy on global health transformation, and we're th three years in, into a health event that's killed, killed over a million, cost trillions in domestic economic damage, and hurt foreign policy on global health. And the main reason reason for this is that the, the domestic and the international politics that feed policy have not been conducive to making pandemic preparedness a strategic indicator um, of that. All right. Before the midterm elections, Congress had adopted no signature uh, legislation supporting transdemic preparedness. The, the administration did secure Transform the structure, climate change, and supply chain security for semiconductors. Goodness. The pol politics of the midterms, I think, also reveal no preparedness as a vital national issue. And with the Republican Party taking initiatives in the beginning of 2023, prospects for transformative legislation have not improved. At the international level, well, the geopolitical competition international system before COVID has had adverse effects on major strategic foreign policy priority. Again, just a couple of indicators of that. Between the the on China on, the, on dealing with China as a geopolitical threat administrations, and I think that just reflects the bipartisan growing concerns about China's power um, and influence well beyond anything to do with. And then, of course, we have the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the balance of power and ideological threat that has produced. And in this context, pandemic preparedness has not the urgency as other issues. And again, just a couple of examples. The Biden administration prioritized competing on infrastructure development, and it wants to compete more effectively in its Belt and Road Initiative in that area. And the administration has priority against the global rise of authoritarianism, again, connected with concerns about China. And I think we can see the lack of geopolitical interest in pandemic preparedness summit where they announced the pandemic fund. When here, we've got millions around the world. It's cost economies trillions of dollars, and it's objective setting them back down. Decades, the world's 20 most powerful economies to this new pandemic fund of 1.4 billion dollars. Now, to make matters worse, right? U.S. foreign policy is now now confronting a global health problem: climate change. Decades of policy failure have made climate change adaptation simply unavoidable in U.S. domestic and. Someone recently said to me, climate change is eating global health. I think climate change is creating, and it's going to continue to create competition over scale in the capital, at home, and abroad, across all kinds of different health paradigms. And let me just wrap up um, with, as we look at what we're going to have in terms of dividing government in Washington, D.C., competition intensifying, not relaxing, and climate change um, a growing threat. Unfortunately, I think we are unlikely to see in U.S. domestic or foreign policies on, on pandemic preparedness, at least over the, and if that prediction, you know, proves true, I think we, we then very much are at risk of opportunity COVID-19 has created to improve pandemic preparedness in the United States. And we may have just repeated the crisis and complacency pattern that has plagued this area. Thank you, David. Well, 
I, I, I guess I'm going to strike a more hopeful tone and say, you know, of course it takes time for societies and governments to really internalize the, the, the extent of the crisis that we've just been through. So, you know, hopefully um, we are at the start of that process, but you're quite right that the G20 came together um, they looked at financing as one of the causes, not the only cause, uh, mm. behind the lack of equity and the speed and deployment of medical countermeasures around the world. And they concluded, you know, that having better preparedness first would prevent um, the need for uh, response, hopefully, at least uh, at large scale. Um, but also th this idea that medical countermeasures could be ever warm and ready to go. All of the panels that looked at lessons learned uh, from other um, uh, crises has sort of concluded the same thing. I would say, you know, CEPI, which is the entity that serves as a kind of um, uh, R&D operation, a collab international collaboration on R&D as a way to uh, sort of get stuff uh, in the pipeline to be able to be deployed when an outbreak of international concern hits. You know that they have had an okay replenishment, not as not as much as we would hope. And I agree with you that the pandemic fund, you know, as you say, trillions in damages, and we've only managed from the top 20 economies in the world to get 1.4 billion in the coffers so far. So there's so much more to go. On the other hand, interesting that China has joined the pandemic fund, and there is that burden sharing there. So I'm still hopeful. I'm not ready to give up. But you're quite right that so far the signs are not fantastic. Let's go now. Um, to our next speaker, who uh, is Jose Alvarez, who um, you're coming at it from a legal perspective. I presume you have something to say about the IHR, but also what about this pandemic accord and how does it relate uh, to all these ideas we've been talking about? Right, well, thank you uh, for giving me this forum and actually to address this critical issue. I generally agree, agree with Jennifer that in principle, we have what we uh, need in the 2005 international health regs. It took 10 years to get there and only uh, the, uh, the disaster of SARS was actually what prompted them to get it over the door. So I'm not uh, exactly uh, hopeful that uh, the US preferred method of reforming uh, the regime uh, through uh, yet more amendments of the IHRs is actually quicker than the EU preferred method of the pandemic prevention treaty. I think that the US proposal for amending the IHRs are, is basically driven by politics. That is, uh, there's no way that the Biden administration thinks it can get through a pandemic prevention treaty through Congress. But the IHRs, at least as it sees it, uh, can be done through an amendment process that's built into the IHRs. It wouldn't need to go through Congress. So that's what I read into why the US strongly prefers amending the IHRs. And to be sure, I think the IHRs can be improved in uh, in this uh, in a way that is in some ways uh, responsive to Jennifer's solid report for the Academy. So among the things that the U.S. Uh, uh, would change is uh, increase the surveillance of states' core capacity, which is uh, the requirement of the existing IHRs that states have the medical capacity throughout their territories to actually detect a threat to global health. And this would actually connect to the unfunded mandates problem that we certainly have, because the idea is to identify the resource constraints uh, and, and through early warning criteria, risk assessment, actually find out what states need, not just in terms of finances and technical support, but as we've just heard from Justice, how much they can absorb and how much help they need in order to get to absorb any help that might actually come their way. So the surveillance changes are not small, I think, in that regard. Notification changes would be increase the, the uh, time constraints uh, and to identify more precisely what states need to notify. So the changes include uh, actually requiring states to send the genetic sequencing data Mm -hmm. When a new uh, disease threat emerges, it would also enable cooperation uh, between the WHO, 
with the uh, Food and, Ag and, uh, and Agricultural Organization, the World Organization for Animal Health, and UNEP. And that's uh, certainly needed now more, uh, in other words, intergovernmental cooperation between the organizations. Verification would include a tighter time frame for deadlines for states to report within 24 or 48 hours of any uh, public health emergencies of international concern also increasing the ability of the organization of securing information from non-state sources. There also is, uh, I think, a welcome change. So it's not an on-off system for public health emergencies of international concern, but more of a three-layered system. You can have the public health emergency of international concern, but also have one public health emergency of regional concern and also an intermediate health alert. It would also increase the transparency and make it clearer what the role is of the emergency committee with the World Health Organization vis-a-vis -vis the power of the director general of the World Health Organization. And finally, there is the provision for a compliance committee uh, that would oversee states' reports of what they're doing to comply with the IHR obligations and also importantly, provide more non-governmental organizations input through that compliance committee. All of those are very solid. On the other hand, the European Pandemic uh, Treaty has a lot of benefits, but very political uh, challenges ahead. It's not just that the US is unlikely to join, but there is uh, uh, the, uh, the complication that always happens in these negotiations of too much uh, and then uh, what can you actually expect to get at the end of the day? The idea as I understand it, is a framework convention like the Tobacco Framework Convention of the WHO, which is encourages a managerial approach. You get everybody into the room because the principles are so unthreatening, unchallenging, mm -hmm. but then you create a conference of the parties or committee of the parties that will actually do the hard work of turning these into more bonding or, or at least a combination of hard and soft uh, ideas that actually will uh, do the work and will make it possible to take advantage of what I think is an insight from Jennifer's report, which is universal participation at every stage, at every level of global health is not necessary. So the framework convention here would enable uh, different parts of states, even regions to adapt to particular aspects of the convention. It would include in, include things that you cannot possibly do, or at least unlikely to be done through merely amending amending the IHRs. And one of the things that I think that is is a much more deeply intrusive look at the spread of synoptic diseases. That is environmental regulation of wild and live uh, animals, uh, wet markets. Uh, and all the causes of uh, mm -hmm. transmission between health, uh, between humans and animals. And that would e include uh, preventing inadvertent laboratory release of pathogens, also preventing epidemics due to pathogens that are resistant to antimicrobial agents. So this would in, uh, make the organization, or at least this treaty, uh, much more intrusive on, an, on a new area for it and also enable the organization to cooperate with the One Health Initiative, which is looking at much more closely uh, the uh, that human uh, uh, to animal uh, transmission or animal to human, that is, and uh, what causes it. Now, my critique of this, and I know I have very little time, is to simply point out that the World Health Organization's preamble also includes uh, as its second preamble uh, statement, the enjoyment of highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic or social condition. If there's one thing that became clear in the COVID situation it is the global inequality, not just among nations, uh, because of a lack of access to equal access to vaccine to vaccines, but the global inequality and inside nations. That is, uh, the states with the worst inequality adjusted income index scores had the highest mortality rates from COVID. The more unequal the society was, even if it was a relatively wealthy uh, country, the more likely it will have 
very high COVID mortalities. Uh, in my own work, I saw case studies from Brazil, the United States, and India, where the color of skin was closely connected uh, to death rates from COVID. So inequality and human rights is something that, frankly, I don't see the World Health Organization really doing, uh, tackling its basic idea of human rights to health, even though it was clear throughout the COVID pandemic that almost every question uh, that, uh, that we face, the risk of stigmatization, discrimination against certain communities and groups, the failures to address stay-at-home orders and other measures that uh, adversely affect, for example, women and children through domestic violence, adverse health consequences on vulnerable populations that are already subject to discrimination, like those with disabilities, homeless, refugees, uh, shortages in and, and misuse of supplies, uh, uh, and, and endless misinformation. Uh, what I would like to see, but I'm not hoping to see, uh, to actually politically see in the Pandemic Prevention Treaty would be a serious look at the, uh, at the right to health that states owe, not only to their own populations, but to other states. So there's serious work that has been done by uh, the uh, International Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights under General Comment 14 of the Right to Health uh, about that states have an obligation, not just a moral duty, to help other states defend the right to health, uh, not just because this is essential to their own security interests and their own health, uh, because obviously the the a threat to health in one place affects others, but also as a legal obligation. And I would just recall that most human rights uh, enforcement is also soft. So this would not necessarily turn the World Health Organization into a human rights cop in any sense. Mm -hmm. But I think there is quite a lot of merit to looking at the core capacity obligations of states uh, at, through a lens, a human rights lens. Mm -hmm. And that also includes looking at one health that this system for looking at synoptic diseases through a, a multidisciplinary lens, that lens has to include expertise in human rights because human rights failures help to explain some of the wet markets, some of the situations and, and threats to the environment that have caused these diseases. So um, I'm not predicting that either the EU or the US will go beyond a, a science-based approach to disease prevention, mm -hmm. but I hope that they do. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for uh, covering so carefully, you know, what are the sort of elements of both uh, the I IHR amendments as well as the uh, EU accord or treaty, sort of what the different instruments can help uh, to deliver. Um, I did want to ask you one question in follow up to your comments. Well, actually, two. So, a lot of the discussion around equity has really been around IP. Um, and I, I noticed that no one has mentioned that. I just would like to hear, you know. This, this was really the focus of many activists. It was, it was, uh, you know, it was, you know, embodied by the distribution of vaccines, but, you know, we could have different views on, you know, how much IP contributed to the access differentials that we witnessed. But, you know, is this like a, it, it, it's not something that can really be easily dealt with in some of these legal instruments, but can I ask each of you to sort of respond to that concern that has been so much on the table over the past, years, maybe starting with Jennifer? Yeah, I mean, we, we looked at this and also, of course, looked um, carefully at some of the issues around COVAX. I would say that there has been a tendency, at least in what I have looked at and, and those that I have talked to, to focus more on the barrier of technology transfer, what, you know, what the new um, text of the draft is talking about, refers to as know-how. But in digging a little deeper, it still seems to me to be a deflection. Yes, there is that issue, but there is also an issue around IP. So it is at every stage. And I think if we are looking at trying to create a decentralization 
of the capacity to produce and distribute and administer countermeasures, we have to be looking at every stage in the chain. And I'm a little worried that there has been, my others may correct my impression and maybe it's moved on, that there was this deflect to say, it's not really about IP. Where we should be concerned is with the transfer of, of technology. I still believe there is, uh, there is an issue at that, at that front end. But whether uh, that question could be dealt with through the international negotiating body at the moment, given that even those states that were, you know, wanting to lead on on a on a pandemic prevention uh, treaty, have been very wily on <laughs> their commitment to IP reform. I'm I'm not that hopeful, but I would just I would just encourage us to not forget about IP uh, as the discussion has evolved to focus on other steps in the in the in the train towards uh, providing these uh, countermeasures to populations. Uh, Jose, do you have thoughts on this? No, I, I generally agree with Jennifer. I think it's got to be all of the above. It's got to be both dealing with uh, IP issues as well as transfer of technology. Whether, uh, and I'm also, alas, uh, not optimistic that this particular exercise which is led and promoted by some of the countries that are most protective of intellectual property. And I'm not putting the US in it because the US is, is on the sidelines, but certainly Europe is. I, am, I think that may be one too, many, uh, too much of an issue uh, for this pandemic prevention treaty, which is carrying quite a weight, bit of weight as it is uh, to carry. So I would think that would take, and I'm just guessing, um, a much more serious uh, 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 interaction between the WTO and uh, others. That is, I think that's where the heart of this discussion would probably end up. Yeah, and I mean, I think, well, there's, uh, there's this paper that came out of the World Bank that looks at what explains the timing of different countries' deliveries, and it really is very associated, this is not a causal thing, but it is very associated with the time of order as when did you have money to put up? Of course, there were still, you know, crowding out because supply was so constrained at the beginning. Um, but, you know, the answer has been uh, the idea of decentralizing capacity to produce and things like that. Now, that was an idea that was part of the pandemic influenza preparedness framework as well. And some of the regional kind of manufacturing arrangements that were in place after the PIP framework was constructed have not, um, really prospered. But on the other hand, um, countries do have access to medical countermeasures from the companies that participate in the exchange of samples. And that part seems to have worked well. Again, I'm not an expert in this area, but can you, I don't know, Justice, if you have thoughts on this or David or any, or really anyone else, you know, what about this PIP framework versus kind of the wholesale IP is up for grabs during pandemic, everything goes, or, or you know, how important is the money versus the sharing of IP? Do, pe do people have thoughts on that? Maybe we'll have to do another yeah. event on that with, with other super experts, because I recognize that it's a, it's a complex field, but uh, to the extent that people have comments, let me know. David. Just, yeah. Can you, I took. Are you still, are people still, still having trouble out a little bit. hearing me? Yeah, okay. but it's okay. Just go for it. Okay. From a U.S. foreign policy point of view, what we fail to do interest, we are actually pretty good on development and, and humanitarian issues, in, but we were terrible at protecting Americans and the American economy from global health, even though we talked the talk but didn't walk the walk beforehand. The one, one thing we could write was operate warp speed and so in that can in that con powerful incentives not just to double down but to triple down on its approach for which isn't gonna be music to the ears of many people in the global helping it as a as that foreign policy responsibility it looks looks bit than you typically hear in the global health conversation Yeah, I definitely think there's an enormous amount to learn from um, what the U.S. government did under Operation Warp Speed. And, you know, many commentators even saying, why aren't we continuing to press forward on 
uh, continued countermeasures on COVID-19 using similar models of uh, uh, pull financing or, or um, market guarantees. Um, do you, Jose or Justice, have uh, thoughts on um, the, the question that I posed? I suggest another panel with far better <laughs> than I am, certainly. Okay, we'll reconvene, we'll reconvene. But Justice, do you, do you have thoughts? I mean, you know, we talk a lot about regional manufacturing. The economics of regional manufacturing are complicated. The piece that seems to be missing is the demand side. You know, who's going to order what is produced? Um, there are some interesting things happening with Institut Pasteur, with Afrogen. Do you have some thoughts on that from where you sit? Uh, thank you very much. The African Union has been very clear. Um, I mean, Africa has huge markets. Um, I mean, if I think the African Union called for up to 30% or whatever of vaccines purchased for Africa by global mechanisms such as Gavi and the others to be purchased from, you know, these um, that are okay, that, that are coming up um, on the continent. Um, so again, I think just like the issue of IP, th these are... These, these seem to be sensitive issues because there are many players involved. I mean, it's not, it's not simply Gavi, you know, coming up and making a decision overnight to purchase more from, from Africa. Um, Gavi is also funded by other, you know, states and others who have, who have interests. So we do recognize that it's a very thorny issue, but, you know, commitment. And though, as, as, as Jose, Jose said, you know, uh, we are not so optimistic that the pandemic treaty um, would be able to address all these issues. We actually are hopeful that these issues will be addressed because they are real issues that affect um, states. Over. Jennifer, did you have any thoughts on the idea of the PIP framework or that's the pandemic influence and preparedness framework vis-a-vis -vis these other no, I conversations? Think, uh, yeah, I think on, on this question, um, you know, you're tapping, you're tapping beyond my particular expertise. It needs a, it needs a really focused discussion because you're right. It, it, it is one of the core issues associated with what the negotiating body is talking about, but there, one could also uh, predict that it will simply fall off the table uh, at a very early stage, the references to in, uh, intellectual property, because it is just so difficult. Okay, that sounds good. Well, let's shift now to um, you all signaled the issue of political urgency, uh, you know, and political will, and how there are a lot of worrying signs about the issue falling off the table. There's so much going on. There's debt distress in a lot of lower income countries. There's um, food security issues related to inflation and the war on Ukraine. All of this is going on at the same time. Uh, people just seem to want to, for politicians particularly, seem to want to forget about COVID. So what do you think could happen or that the international media community could do to sort of keep the fire burning on this? Um, maybe if you could offer a couple of ideas, maybe we'll start with uh, justice this time. Yeah, sorry. Thanks. Thanks for that. Look, I think a couple of things that the international community needs to do, um, um, and, and 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 let me stick to the area of financing, um, you know, of 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 pandemic preparedness and response. It is important. I mean, we've seen <laughs> we've seen that the, the 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 fund has only raised what less than fifteen percent of what is targeted. Um, we we saw Covax raised <laughs> less than what what it's planned to do. I think it is important for the international community to ag acknowledge that we need not put all our eggs in one basket. Um, you know, however big a, 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 a pandemic fund would be, um, or however big any global initiative would be, we need to acknowledge that there are other potential initiatives, other sources that could help, you know, leverage some of the resources that are available. Um, I mean, we've talked about the fact that, um, for instance, public development banks, uh, you know, together could actually probably raise a bit more than the pandemic fund is raising. Um, we, 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 as a, as an international community, we need to 
acknowledge and actively promote initiatives that uh, diversify these sources while ensuring that yes, we have a we 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 have a you know we move towards the same direction. Um, and I think it's 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 also important that we've seen, for instance, that the many countries have moved in. I mean, the, the WHO would soon come up with the explanatory the database um, report, but many countries and many private uh, sources have moved in to provide some support, uh, both in terms of financing, but also in terms of supporting with the delivery of of some of these things. So there are a lot that we need to do. We know not drop the ball. Uh, we need to take advantage of every opportunity to talk about them and to act about, on, on these things. So, uh, yeah, I really agree with you. And I think one of the ideas behind the pandemic fund was really to try and promote co-financing with public development banks or multilateral development banks, because we know that a lot of this is basic public health expenditure. It should be on budget. You know, it's a great way to get, you know, that government buy in to projects. And it could also be uh, not just at the national level, but at the subnational level. So we'll, we'll continue to watch this space. And obviously, the design arrangements around the pandemic fund matter for how much they're able to uh, leverage or cooperate in terms of other uh, groups. I mean, I would also say, you know, if I look at the African Development Bank, uh, just given the strength of the African Union and the African CDC, you know, should they be part of this discussion and thinking about investments in health going forward? Um, you, you could definitely see an argument for that. So we'll, we'll work on that justice in our third next event. Um, let me then, I'll, I'll go to you, uh, David, on what do you think we should be doing differently to keep uh, attention on this issue? Well, what we face now is there is no single fire anymore on this question and the, i mean given the scale of the, the covid 19 pandemic and the and economic and social carnage it left in its wake i mean that that i know no more pledges will come for the pandemic fund but it's very deflating and we're so like there's an urgency we have to get it done in the window of opportunity and when we miss that now it's a great time um, you know, I think what, what has to happen now is that you've got to have different context where you actually see motivation and priorities being set. This is not competing well in the in, in the the triage that happens in force to threats and, and issues. So, for example, I think that if there are ways to build infrastructure more into the geopolitical competition about infrastructure, there's some of that in connection with the vaccine manufacturing in Africa. But I think that's one is of planting this seed more as, as justice indicated in regional organizations. Taking advantage of this desire apart, upon, on, on the part of low-income autonomy and health sovereignty, I think that actually could be useful to exploit that. This isn't necessarily with some of the rhetoric and the hopes about global public goods and solidarity, meaning um, equity. So I think there's a lot of ways in which we can aggregate the problem and try to make progress in lots of different categories. At least that's, we still need to transform U.S. foreign policy on global health, but we aren't going to lost that momentum to do it in one fell swoop. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there are opportunities lit in a number of important places. I think that also includes the multilateral development bank as well. So it's it's going to look different than I think everybody thought it would in the shock and awe of the pandemic. That's gone. Um, and it's yeah. not coming back. Well, you never know. There could be a new more dangerous variant. <laughs> okay. So we're um, we're a few minutes before the end. So I'm going to ask uh, Jose, you next, and maybe Jennifer, you can sort of conclude for us. This is obviously such a big topic, so many different dimensions. Um, but Jose, a, a few final words of reflection. Yeah, so on your last point, I think uh, what I heard both Justice and David say is that we need to see this from a somewhat different framing. 
the framing that I think is most favorable to getting money where it's needed is an SDG development capacity mm -hmm. building infrastructure and even connecting it to climate change because there are definite connections between uh, the environmental uh, catastrophe of climate change and uh, the environmental uh, species extinctions that may actually cause the next pandemic. So I think it would be healthy, uh, at least from my standpoint, to prefer that framing than the security framing, which could end you back into the UN Security Council, where at least until Ukraine ends, we have a stalemate. And I think when you started this, Amanda, you mentioned the politics between US and China. I'd like to at least return to that uh, with a hope that if you reframe this, not as a security issue, not as something before the Security Council, but in other places where we can still talk, uh, and I mean US, China, then that could help bring in other uh, players, including the Asian development banks. Uh, so that I do think that um, the U.S.-China thing is still in the way, but I think you can reframe it away. Jennifer. Yeah, I really agree with this, with these last two sets of points. One on, uh, on leveraging the SDG framework, which is something that, you know, we continuously hold on to as having... Uh, a consensus and having lots of different indicators that can be mobilized. But I also think we shouldn't minimize, and you know, people may be smiling when I say this, we shouldn't minimize what will happen in the General Assembly later this year. Because I do think, to Jose's point about the paralysis in the UN Security Council, it is through the GA that you can bring this back to a political high level. I mean, one part of the pandemic treaty is about governance reform, again, connected to the WHO. But the key point I think that the independent panels have made is that we need high level political attention on this issue at different points in time. One can do it very strategically, connecting it to uh, you know, geopolitical competition, but one can also do it through the formal mechanisms like the GA. There will be, with hope, a political declaration. There will be a high level meeting which enables us to galvanize uh, political attention to this in New York over the coming year. Uh, and that may breed some, some positive developments, particularly if we connect it to development. David says no, but uh, I think it's at least worth a shot uh, to think about what that might uh, produce. Well, I think it's probably the case that we have to take a portfolio approach on this. And it's, as I think Jose said this, it's all of the above, <laughs> probably in terms of framing, because it is, it, it really does make sense from a biosecurity lens and it makes sense from a development perspective as well. Um, one of the questions that came in, uh, I'll just leave the audience with this and our panelists. If there were a new pandemic tomorrow, what mechanisms are now in place for collective action for advanced purchase and procurement? And uh, well, we would, might have to get the band back together on that. <laughs> but I, I would tell you that one of the main ones, which is Act Day, was sort of a formally uh, declared over recently. Um, and of course, but we do have um, some of the regional initiatives, I think, that have stepped up in the meantime, both in Sub Saharan Africa and in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, but it's it's certainly the case that there would be an enormous amount of doubt around what would happen uh, if we have pandemic flu next month. We're still a bit in disarray. So anyhow, with that as our final message, just to say we'll keep on working on these issues. Really, congratulations, Jennifer and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences for a really interesting paper. And thanks to all of you panelists for joining us. Um, and uh, we'll keep on having these conversations and stay tuned. Thank you very much. Thank you.